Hey everyone, welcome to our third week of Advent study sessions. I hope you're doing well today. My name is Graham for anyone that I haven't had the chance to meet before. It's great to be with you. I hope you've really had the chance to enter into this season of Advent in a meaningful way over these last couple of weeks as Josh has led us through hope and then faith. As you can see, we're going to be talking about joy this week. The pink candle is lit. It represents joy. Someone somewhere at some point in history decided that pink represented joy. So that's what we're going to be talking about together this week. And I'll get to that in a second. But as you know already, Advent is a season that's marked by longing and waiting and expectation. It's this interesting time on the church calendar where we attempt to do a couple of different things. Firstly, we're attempting to look back over a couple thousand years and identify with those who were waiting on the first coming of Christ, those who were waiting on the coming Messiah, trying to identify with them, understand what their mindset might have been, and, and to be with them almost in, in that space. And at the same time, we as a people and the people of God are still waiting and longing for the second coming of Christ, right? We still exist in the now and not yet. And so there's very much a, a real sense of longing and waiting for us as well. And I would venture to say that there's never been an Advent season where we can more deeply enter into that place of waiting and longing than here in Advent 2020, where we're longing for so much, right? Because of all that's going on around us right now in our culture. So here we are in the midst of Advent, and I think it's a really rich season for a lot of different reasons. So we're gonna be talking together about joy, like we said. And joy is one of those words that we see everywhere, right? We see it, especially at this time of year, on Christmas cards, we hear it in commercials, we see it on billboards, we hear it in songs. So it's joy, joy, joy everywhere, but it can be one of those words that has a slightly different meaning to different people. I think for a lot of us, joy is used kind of simultaneously with happiness, right? They're used kind of interchangeably. For other people, I think joy becomes this sort of extreme version of happiness. It's maybe the most intense meaning or most intense version of happiness. But I think the, the understanding or definition of joy that I've come to resonate with the most is the sense that joy is a bit more deeply rooted. It has a bit more of a robust connotation to it. It doesn't so much ebb and flow with circumstances like happiness might. I think there's still an emotional element to joy for sure, but it doesn't have that same ebb and flow or up and down. Rather, it's more deeply rooted and it doesn't depend on circumstance. And joy can be present in good seasons and hard seasons and everything in between. And I think the reason that I resonate with that kind of a definition of joy is that it helps me to understand scriptures that speak to things like rejoice always, be thankful in all circumstances, or in James 1, 2, it says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. And I don't know that there's necessarily a ton of happiness when we're in the midst of trial, in the midst of something that's really, really hard, but Scripture says that there can still be joy. We can consider it joy. So we got to have a definition and an understanding that can encompass all of that, right? We also see joy show up in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I think with a lot of those other fruits of the Spirit, we accept the fact that there's some effort required on our part, that it requires spiritual discipline of some kind, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, they all require effort. They require that we be shaped and formed into the kind of people who can exemplify those fruits in, in our lives. But I think it can be harder for us to attach that same sense of effort to joy. I think we almost assume that that should come kind of automatically or we're just joyful people or you know whatever that might be. But there it is right in the midst of the other fruits of the Spirit that, that also require effort of, of some kind. So with all of this as kind of a backdrop, and with this understanding of, of joy and what joy 
might be, how we might define it. What, what does it look like for us to pursue it? I found it really interesting a few weeks ago when we were in the midst of conversations about matters of racial injustice. Thank you for your participation in that. I think that was really healthy and the conversations that came from that were really healthy in a lot of different ways. And it was interesting to me as we listened to different voices and, and voices within the African American community to hear them talk about how the African American community, both within the church and outside of the church as well, have learned what it is to walk through life carrying joy and sorrow together and, and living in that tension. They, as a people group, have encountered all kinds of struggle, all kinds of sorrow, and yet they have also learned to live with joy. And they hold those together. And it was mentioned, one, one of the speakers or one of the interviews that we watched, mentioned the fact that those of us in the majority culture are still struggling with that notion a lot. And we're still running around trying to avoid pain or sorrow at all costs, so much so that when we're in that place of hardship, when we're in that place of struggle, we feel like we've done something wrong or that something's gone wrong and we try and get out of it as much as possible. And yet we have a lot to learn from the African American community and other communities about what it looks like to walk through life holding joy and sorrow together. I think, especially at Christmas time, we can struggle with this whole notion of, of trying to escape pain, trying to escape something that, that doesn't feel good and, and focus instead on joy, joy, joy. It can be a hard thing, right, in the midst of this season. I wanna read from one of the blogs on our website. If you haven't read Amanda Opelt's blog yet that just went up a few days ago, check that out for sure at theheart.us. But these are Amanda's words about this Advent season and some of this stuff that we're talking about here. She says, I am human. I live in a broken world. None of us is exempt from suffering, no matter how easy our life has been up to this point, no matter how many good, responsible decisions we have made, no matter how honorable or noble a person we are. If I can shake off the shock of this adversity, then I can begin to allow it to mold me in some remarkable ways. If I can shake off the shock of this adversity, I can allow it to mold me. So joy and sorrow, they, they exist together. And in light of this, how do we pursue joy? How do we pursue it in this Advent season? How do we pursue it in 2020? How do we pursue it in any and all seasons of, of our lives? I wanna throw out just a couple of principles for you guys to consider. This is certainly not an exhaustive list, but hopefully these are helpful thoughts in this whole realm of joy. The first thing I, I wanna talk about is the practice of lament. And that might seem like kind of a weird flex when we're talking about joy and Advent and Christmas to bring up lament. But I'll explain why in a second. You, you, you might've heard me talk about lament in a few different spaces recently over the course of the last few months. And it, it's really a new thing for me. I grew up in a faith tradition and a family culture where you just banked the positive, you focused on what was good and you kept trucking forward and that's not bad, it's really not. And some seasons of our lives require that we live that way. But when we look at a whole lifetime or how we're to live over the course of our whole life, it, it seems like that might be a little incomplete. And in fact, we see in scripture, in the life of Job and Jeremiah and David, and even in the life of Christ himself, we see the practice of lament in very real and powerful ways. And I've come to learn, and again, this is new for me, I'm still in the midst of it, so we're in this together, but I've come to learn that lament and the practice of lament isn't opposed to joy or happiness or celebration. They're not opposed to one another. In fact, lament and the practice of lament can actually be a pathway into a much more robust, deep joy, deep hope. And so they kind of depend on one another in some ways. And so I've come to embrace more and more the idea of lament, again, as a pathway to joy. And so that's why I mention it in this context. That's why I'm talking about it in an Advent season, in a week focused on joy. 
And all lament is, if it's new to you or if you're not really familiar with that language, lament is just a practice of saying out loud or maybe committing to paper. There's something powerful about writing it down, but saying out loud or writing down the, the wrestling and struggle that we have about some of the realities in the world. It might be in our own individual personal lives. It might be in the lives of our family. It might be in our country or in the world. Whatever it might be, those places of deep wrestling that you do, if we can get those out and offer them to God, I believe that can actually move us down the path towards a robust joy. And so what I want to give you just really briefly are seven really simple steps for developing your own lament. And again, it could be on paper. If you're a writer, it could just be spoken out loud. But these are seven really simple steps. You could do it on your own. You could do it as a group exercise. But here they are. I'm going to write them up on the board here and hope that you can read it. We've already discussed my handwriting, I think, in other study sessions. So we'll just move on. The first step So simple steps for developing our own lament. The first is to cry out to God. You're addressing God, you're coming to Him. You're expressing to God that you're in a hard place. The second is to name your complaint. What is it that is breaking your heart? What is it that's causing your pain? What is it that's making you angry? Name this before God. The third is an affirmation of your trust in God and of who He is. We remember who God has been in our lives in the past and we name that too. The fourth is a request. What is it, as you think about the situation that feels really hard, what is it that you're asking of God? What's your deepest desire for that situation? What is it that you want to be set right? A fifth step would just be any additional argument is the language in this resource that I've used, but it, that simply means anything else to add, anything more, any reasons why God should intervene. The sixth is a promise to God that we will honor Him, that we will praise His name no matter the season, or the circumstance, again, in the midst of putting together this lament, we're remembering who God is. And the seventh, similarly, is an assurance. An assurance, again, of who God is, maybe the attribute that you're most thankful for, naming specific attributes of God. It might even be introducing different names of God that you resonate with in scripture, but an assurance of his character and of his goodness. So you cry out to God, you name your complaint, you affirm your trust in God, you name specifically the request and what you want to see be done differently or be brought to resolution. Anything more to add, the promise that you will honor God and the assurance of his character and of who he is. And as we commit that to paper or as we speak that out loud, I believe it holds significance and I believe it leads us down a pathway to true joy. The other thing I wanted to mention just quickly is the whole idea of presence and mindfulness. I want to read from Amanda's blog again. I told you already to check it out. Go read it. She says to do with this whole idea of presence. This is something my counselor refers to as attention to detail. I struggle with this when I find myself in a situation I desperately want to be out of. Rather than fully inhabiting my body and the physical space I'm in, my mind and heart reside in that hoped for future. 
I numb with entertainment, food, drink, busyness, insert the thing that you numb with in an attempt to accelerate time. But my counselor encourages me to attend to the things around me. There is beauty to be found even in this painful season, the warmth of a fire, the smell of a pie in the oven, the taste of a cup of coffee, the feel of the air just before snowfall. The decision to savor is a survival skill. But one of the things that I love about this is that certainly it is a survival skill in really hard times, but I think presence and attention to detail and being mindful is also so applicable to really good times. I think they help build joy within us, help build celebration within us in the good times as well. So I think this idea of presence and attention to detail and savoring what's around us is so good and right no matter the season. And I think it does, again, lead to joy. Ecclesiastes 2.24, Amanda quotes it in her blog. It says, a person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. So whether we're in really good seasons, whether we're in really hard seasons, I think these simple practices and concepts of lament and presence can be really helpful. Let's not look just for the mountaintop experiences alone, though those are great and we celebrate them. Let's pay attention to the little things too. So here we are, third week of Advent. Joy. Let me leave you with a few questions to consider as we reflect on all of this together and reflect on this third week. Are you feeling joyful in this season? Why or, or why not? Maybe share a bit about that with one another. Are there hard things in your life that you're still running from because you're afraid that they'll steal your joy? How can you think about that a bit differently? Do we believe it's possible to live with joy in all seasons? Where have we seen God at work in this area of our life or even just in this Advent season? Thanks again, guys, for letting me be a part of this week's study session. It's always a gift to sit with some of these things and these concepts it ministers to those of us who are presenting in, in really significant ways, as well as hopefully to you all. We're thankful for each one of you. Let me pray for you. And we'll go from there. God, we are so thankful that we can come to you in all seasons and all circumstances. We can come to you when we are on top of a mountain, excited about life, and we can come to you when we're in the depth of a valley and you meet us where we are. We're profoundly thankful for that, God. And so would you lead us on with all that is ahead, God, in the immediate, in this Advent season and Christmas season and the turn of the year into 2021, would you lead and guide, even in the midst of all the craziness that surrounds us, God, would you keep our eyes focused on you? Would you help us to live into these Advent themes of hope and faith and joy would we be found in the midst of your presence? And would we be able to interact with one another and with our communities and families over these next few weeks from, from that place? We give this time to you in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.